You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back everybody to the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. We are starting with a new Talmud this week. It's the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat 30b. We've done this a bunch of years ago. And I think it's time to review this because this is amazing. The Gemara talks about the greatness of Hillel. And this is 30b on the bottom. And Toner Abonon, the rabbis taught in Abraisa, La'olam yehe adam anvesan ki Hillel. One should always strive to be humble and gentle in his ways like Hillel. Ve'al yehe kapton kishamai. And let one not be stern and unyielding like Shammai. So Hillel had a softness to him. He had a gentle humility. And Shammai was a tougher personality. And the Talmud here says, be more like Hillel and less like Shammai. It once happened that there were two people. And now we're on the 31a. They made a wager, a bet between one another. Amru, they said... Call me Sheyelich Viaknetes Hillel, Yito Arba Meoisus. Whoever goes and provokes Hillel to lose his temper, let him take 400 Zuz as his prize. Omar Echod Mehem, thereupon one of them said, Ani Aknitehu, I am going to provoke him. Okay, the Bryce recounts the events that followed. Osehayomer of Shabbos Hayom. That day, as it happened, was Friday, the eve of Shabbos. Vihilel Chofafes Rosho, and Hill was busy washing his head, his hair, in preparation for Shabbos. He was showering. Holach Overal Pesach Beso Omar. As he was doing so, this person who was trying to provoke Hillel went and passed by the doorway of his house, calling, Me Khan Hillel, Me Khan Hillel, is there Hillel here? Is there any Hillel here? Nisatef Yatzel across a Hillel put on his cloak. And went out to greet this person. Omar Lo, he said to him, Bni, ma tamavakesh, my son, what is it that you seek? Omar Lo, the person replied to him, She'elo yeshli lisho. I have an important question to ask you. Omar Lo, Sha'al bni Sha'al, my son, ask, Hillel replied, ask. Mi pnei ma roshen shel bavliim skalgolois. Why is it that the heads of the Babylonians, the Persians, why are they round? Why are they so round? Amrlo, Hillel, Hillel responded, My son, you have asked a truly profound question. The reason is because they do not have skillful midwives. Okay. The person went and waited a little while. Chazar ve'amar, and then he returned to the front of Hillel's house and called out, Mikan Hillel, Mikan Hillel, who here is Hillel, who, where is Hillel? Nisatif yatzel, across the hill, again was in the bathhouse, he dries himself off, comes back out, and he says, Amar lo, b'ni matam avakesh, what is it that you seek, my son? Amar lo, she'elu yesh li lishol, I have a question to ask you. Amar lo, she'al b'ni she'al, my son, ask, ask all you want. He says, He says, why are the eyes of the Tarmodians from the Syrian desert? Their eyes are round, very round. They have very round eyes. Amr lo, My son, you've asked a very good question, a very profound and important question. Because they live... In sandy terrain. Okay, now we're going to stop here for a second. I want to read to you what the commentary says about this, okay? He pretended not to know who Hillel was. That's number one. Like to humiliate him. Like who's Hillel? Anybody know who Hillel is? I heard there's someone Hillel around here. It's like, you know. And called out to him as one would call out an ordinary peasant. This is particularly disparaging. Since, at the time, Hillel was the Nasi, he was the leader of the Jewish people. He was the foremost leader of the Jewish people. Additionally, the person approached Hillel on Friday afternoon, a time when Hillel 
was not likely to have time for a lengthy discussion. In these ways, he hoped to provoke Hillel to display irritation. So he's going to pick him at the worst time possible. I want to tell you, I'm not a Hillel. I'm really not a Hillel. But I had this last week. I really had this last week. So we're about to do the event for Rabbi Brody. It's like 20 minutes before the event. And a guy comes into the Torch Center. It comes into my office. I'm about, I'm just setting up the computers, making sure everything is ready for his presentation. A guy walks in to the center and sits down in my office. A guy I've never, never met before. And I said to him, you know, we're, we're about to start an event here in 20 minutes. And he sees people coming in. People are showing up. It's like, you know, hey, Rabbi Wolby, how are you? You know, everyone's peeking their head into the, into this. And this guy is just sitting there. And I said, you know, kind of have a lot of people coming here. Like in, in 20 minutes, our event starts. Um, is it okay that we like, we'll just talk right after the event? And he's like, it'll, it'll just take a few minutes. It'll just take a few minutes. <laughs> and I was like, this is like clearly a sign from Hashem that I need to be tested in this area because, I mean, I was like, without having gone to the Muslim master class, you know, I probably would have said, you know, it's just not a good time. I, I'm sorry, but, you know, just find another place, another time for this because this is just like, just go. I didn't say that. I was about to. I wanted to. That's what he should have understood. But Hashem wanted me to just be patient. So I turned away from my computer, and I looked him squarely at his face, and I said, you have my undivided attention. And I think that's what Hashem wanted me to do. It's like, you know what? Everything's going to fall into place anyway. But it was very testy. It was very. It was, it was not an easy thing. So I, I, I'm not a Hillel. But I totally understand the challenge Hill was facing because it's like you're right before Shabbos. It's like, like this is like the worst time possible. And now you decided to come talk to me. I'm here all day. You can come to me any day of the week. Now you have to come 10 minutes before an event now. And I told him there's an event coming. And it's like it didn't occur to him that there was any relevance to what I was saying. <laughs> it's like either way. Yep. Our translation is based on the version given by Rashi that Rashi first suggests that its galgolas indicates an oblong shape to the head. Okay, so it was oblong. If you look at the, the Persians, they have heads that look like a little bit like an egg-shaped head. Although the person's question was actually trivial, Hillel nevertheless treated it with deference. Hillel's practice was never to dismiss any question as unimportant for he did not wish to discourage people from approaching him at any time. And the truth is, is that even this guy who came to me, it was like, really, that's what you need? That's what, like, that's what you're bothering me for right now? Which has made it all more comical. It's like, where I knew is a sign from Hashem, like, you need to just, just take it easy and just give everyone the attention they need at the time they need it. It's not always convenient. My great-grandfather of blessed memory May his blood be avenged. In the introduction to the book that they wrote from all of his notes, it says that he worked on a specific trait of countenance, of greeting every person with a smile at all times. For two years he worked on this trait. Imagine, yeah, it's Erev Shabbos. It's right before Shabbos. It's like all crunch time. Everything is like... And your neighbor comes and says, I need to talk to you about a matter. And they're talking very slowly. And you're like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Let's go, let's go. You know, it's, you know, it's uncomfortable. And it's like, just spit it out. Just say what's going on. Like, you know, it's like, so you know, and, and this, I have to give you some background, some research, like some history. So I'm like, oh, my goodness. Wow, just get to the point, right? No, no, no. Not to rush them. To greet every person with a smile, with everyone with a, a presence of mind, to be there with them, for them. That's really greatness. Greeted every person with a smile. And it's something that if we can take this from Hillel, take it from my great-grandfather, that's an incredible, incredible trait. So the Talmud here continues, and this is the, the commentary still. 
He says the midwives improperly shape the head of the infant at birth. Mar Shah posits that Hillel's answer also contains a deeper meaning, in which he was alluding to certain elements of the Babylonian national character, that perhaps their character was not, not proper from childhood. From their childhood, it wasn't just their physical features aren't ordinary, but the way they act and the way they think and the way they're, they're trained as children wasn't either proper. Okay, the Talmud now continues. So this person now asks two questions. He leaves now after the second question, which was about the eyes. Now, why were the eyes like that? So our sages tell us because their eyes were in a specific way that even though there's a lot of sand, the sand wouldn't get into their eyes. Hashem made their eyes special. So the individual leaves, he goes away, and he comes back a little while later. Chazavra Amar, and he returns to Hillel, and he calls out, Mikan Hillel, who is Hillel? Mikan Hillel, who is Hillel? Nisatef Yatzel, across the Hillel again, leaves the bathhouse, he dries himself off, gets dressed again, and greets the individual, Amarlo, Bni Ma Ata Mevakesh, my son, how can I help you? What do you seek? Amarlo, this person tells Hillel, She'eli Yeshli Lishol, I have another question to ask you. Amarlo, Sha'al Bni Sha'al, my son, ask, ask all you want. He asks, why are the feet of Africans so wide? Amar Lo, he says to him, My son, you've asked profound questions. He says, because they live in swamp lands, so that they not sink into the quicksand, into the, into the terrain that they live in, Hashem gave them a gift of bigger, wider feet so that they can stand on it. God gave them wider feet so their feet would not sink into the marshy earth. Alternatively, because of the terrain, the people tended to walk about without shoes, which in turn caused their feet to widen somewhat. And then there are many commentaries that talk about this. This is just an allegory. This is just a muscle for something. This is a um, tale of their essence and their character. Okay. Having failed to exasperate Hillel with his earlier questions, the person made one last attempt to do so. Amr Lowy says now to Hillel, She'elos harbi yesh I have many, many questions to ask you. But I'm fearful that you might get angry with me. Nisatef Yoshev Lefonov Amarlo Hillel wrapped himself in his cloak, sat down in front of him, and said to him, Kol she'elus she'yesh l'chalishol she'al. Every question that you have to ask, feel free to ask. Which in a sense was like, no, 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 I'm not running anywhere. I'm not running back into the bathhouse. Wraps himself up. He's just like, okay, any question you have, please ask. Give you all the time in the world. No rush. Amarlo, he said to him, are you the Hillel, the great Hillel, whom they call the Nasi of the Jewish people, the leader of the Jewish people? Amarlo, hey. He says, indeed, I am, yes. Amarlo, the person said to him, Im atahu, if you are indeed that leader, if you, this is indeed you, Lo yirbu there should let there not be many like you among the Jewish people. Amrlo, Hill says, Bini, Mipnema. Why would you say such a thing? Amrlo, he says, because Mipnesha Ibadati Al Yodhar Bame Zuz. Because of you, I lost four hundred Zuz. And he revealed to Hill the wager that he had made. Amrlo Havi Zoibru Chacho. Hillel says, be very careful, be very vigilant and guard yourself so that he maintains equanimity in all situations. Okay, that's what the, the Mishnah says. You should be very careful with your with your disposition, with your don't get angry, don't be easy to Kedai It is worth your losing on his account, on Hillel's account, four hundred Zeus. And yet another four hundred Zeus? Eight hundred Zeus. That's a fortune of money. And for Hillel not to get angry at you.
it's worth it. So we're going to continue this Gemara further. But I want to just elaborate on this for a minute. That Hillel is saying it's worth it for you to lose another 400 Zuz, meaning 800 Zuz, just so that I not get angry. What is so bad with Hillel getting angry? What is so bad with someone getting angry? Especially someone who's a sage, someone who's a scholar, and I will tell you. I said this recently twice in class. There's a video you can search on YouTube of the Pope hitting someone. It was one of his followers came to see him and was all excited and and was holding his hand like wanting to get a blessing, and he slaps them. That's anger. That's not greatness. That's not what the Torah teaches us. On the other hand, contrast that with my trip to Israel. My recent trip to Israel two and a half months ago, I met with 20, 30 rabbis. There's lines around the building, people waiting to see them, and they greeted every single person with the most patience, with the most kindness, with the most compassion, with the most love you can possibly imagine. One after another after another. You'd think one of them would slip up, right? One of them. No, no, no. That's not what Torah does. Torah refines a person. Torah refines a person. And that's what Torah does. Torah makes it possible for someone to be disparaged. Oh, who's Hillel? Who are you? Like, imagine you went over to your senator and you say, uh, sir. And he's like, excuse me, I'm senator. You know? Your congressman. Like, you say, hey, Joe, what's up? I'm not your friend. I'm your congressman. I'm your representative, state representative. You know, you've had people, I'm sure you've seen people, excuse me, don't, I'm a doctor. I earned my title. Relax. Hillel had no ears about him. Is this, who's this guy wagering on Hillel's anger? He's like, oh, Hillel, anybody know Hillel? And this, you're talking about the leader of the Jewish people. Now, that doesn't mean that when he asked them, are you the leader of the Jewish people? He's like, yes, I'm not that. He says, yeah, I am. It means you have to know your place. That's not arrogance. Arrogance, I mean, being a leader, a true Torah leader, does not mean that you don't know your position. Moshe Rabbeinu, the humblest of all men. If you ask the Moshe, are you the leader? You'll say, yes, I'm the leader. That doesn't make him arrogant. That makes him knowing his place. On the other hand, when we have Torah and we apply the Torah properly, Torah teaches us sensitivity. Torah teaches us kindness. Torah teaches us that it's not about us. It's about our relationship with God. And just like, and this is our job, to emulate God in our every single day. So yeah, when we're in the supermarket, we're able to display kindness and compassion and love in the proper way. We're able to display what it means to be a servant of Hashem. We're able to display greatness. That's what it is. Hillel is showing that in the greatest, most finest way. I've shared with you in the past, one of my rabbis, it's actually on the 48 Ways podcast, way number 47, I believe, or 46. But my rabbi was always upset at the cabs, that they would gouge him. They would do the, the Israeli cabs. They're very, very uh, shrewd. Let's call them shrewd. They're smart, tactful businessmen. And if you're not, you don't hold to their game, they're going to get money out of you somehow. So you have to be smart too. And sometimes it can be infuriating. It could be maddening. Particularly if you're not Israeli and you don't know their shtick. You don't know their game. You don't know how they, how, how smart they are. So my rabbi said that it was it was maddening for him as an American who lives in Israel and I'd take him for a ride and he'd get very angry until he realized, and this is not my rabbi, rabbi, it's like Berkowitz, it's a different rabbi, and he realized it's not worth it for me to get angry for 10 shekel. It's not worth it for me to get angry for 20 shekel. Look, Hillel says it's not worth it for 800 zuz, which is a lot more than 800 shekel. 
not worth it. If you think about it, if they overcharged you in the restaurant, they overcharged you $6, people go crazy. Yeah, at $6, you're ready to tip the guy, uh, the valet. You're ready to the, you know, it's like, but $6 on my, on my dinner bill. What's wrong with you? And you can make them throw a, a fit. I can't believe it. The $6, right? And then, you know, and then we, we're ready to pay an extra, you know, something, an extra hundred dollars. No, it's a hundred bucks. Big deal, right? Then we say, yeah, it's fine. You can keep it. No big deal. It's just that we feel like someone took advantage of us. We feel like we were wronged. If we realize that everything, everything that happens to us is a test from the Almighty, it doesn't make a difference if the guy did it intentional, not intentional. He says, Hashem testing you. He's saying, hey, guess what? I'm going to give you a challenge here. Let's see if you're okay with this. Let's see if you blow your lid because of the $6 extra fee. But the truth is it's all about perspective. It's all about the perspective that we need to have. Is it worth it for me to give up my, my world to get angry? Imagine this. Imagine you're holding a glass jar on your head. Now, the glass jar is not really a glass jar. It really is your entire spiritual worth, your whole spiritual existence, your relationship with God. It's all in this glass bowl right on your head, and you're balancing it. When you get angry, what you're doing is not only you're not balancing it, you're smashing it on the floor. You lose your patience. Savlanut comes from the word sabal, someone who carries. You're carrying your spiritual world on your head. The minute you lose your patience and you get angry, you're smashing it to smithereens. Comes crashing down to the floor. Hillel says it's not worth it for 800 zoos for me to get angry. It's just not worth it. Not worth it. Because that would be losing everything. That would mean losing everything that I've worked so hard my entire life to attain. Greatness doesn't come with a pill. We're all looking today. You mentioned last week Ozempic, right? You said Ozempic, people, Ozempic was created by Israeli doctors for people with diabetes. And it takes away their appetite and it, 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 it makes it that they lose weight because they have no appetite. So they lose weight and then it fixes their diabetes for many people. And now you have diabetes. And you're trying to get Ozempic and you can't get it because everyone's using it for a diet. Because why? We're in a world where everybody's looking for a quick fix. Everybody's looking for a, a, a what, like the quick cheat, the quick pro program. Guess what? I can eat my chocolate chip cookies and lose weight. Right? Because I'm taking my Ozempic. And that's, that's not the way it works if someone wants to attain something spiritually. If someone wants to grow in their relationship with God, there's no shortcuts to God. It's the, the equivalent to that would be, a rabbi once said, he says, you know, the, these, this, the, the Kabbalah center in California, you have all of these, uh, people, you're not, your mouth is so holy, you shouldn't be even uttering their names. So we know the types of people who go to these places. It's the quick fix type program. It makes you suddenly feel so connected spiritually. It's a quick fix, but there is no quick fix in Judaism. So imagine the following story, okay? So you have a king, he's on the hundredth floor, and he says, anybody who wants can come see me. But in order to come see me, you have to go from ground zero all the way up the staircase and go through each challenge and each tribulation till you're able to see me face to face. Now, each each challenge is, is 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 a struggle. Every floor you go, there's a new challenge. Once you finish the challenge, you go up floor two, and it could take you years and years, or maybe even a hundred years, to get all the way to the top. I have a great idea. I have a friend who has a helicopter. I have a friend who has a helicopter. He'll just fly us up to the hundredth floor, and then we got it. That's what the Kabbalah Center is. It's you can't cheat your way to holiness. It's a fake. It's a fake because it's not real. It has to have the, the, the meat and bones of what it means to go through struggles, 
to go and overcome and understand what it means to have a relationship with God. Not, oh, I'm going to share with you some Kabbalistic secrets, and now that's it. You have the red string, and you're good to go. No, that's that that's that's a shortcut. That's not the way it works. To become great like Hillel, to become someone who is holy, who is dignified, who is patient, who understands the burden of his generation. There's no quick fix for that. You don't become someone who's patient overnight. By the way, you don't either become a good husband or a good wife overnight. It's a lot of work. And every day there's a challenge. And every day there's a struggle. And every day there's another obstacle course. Why can't everything just be bliss? Because only dead people have bliss. Living people have challenges. Living people have struggles. Living people have that in order to get to that place called absolute perfection, you have to go through those hundred floors to get there. And part of being in that struggle means that, yes, every time you overcome another challenge, you overcome another challenge, you overcome another challenge, you're becoming a greater and greater person. You're elevating yourself. You're uplifting yourself. Either way, what I'd like to take out of today's class as a conclusion here is the importance of going in the path of Hillel recognizing that when you have a frustration coming your way, say, I can't wait to see where Hashem leads me with this because this has got to be a trip. And it's going to be a challenge. It's not going to be an easy one. That challenge is what we embrace. We embrace challenge. We don't run away from challenge. The whole world is busy running away from challenge. We're going to numb ourselves. That's why people today all over the place, next door, sadly, to the Torch Center, we have this smoke shop. And it smells sometimes very unpleasant, some unpleasant scents, aromas coming from people smoking certain substances. And you wonder, why do people smoke it? You know why? Because life is so difficult to them. They just want to run away. They just want to run away. That's not, Judaism doesn't run away from problems. We embrace our problems because our problems means we're living in a spiritual existence. It means we're alive. Dead people don't have challenges. Only living people have challenges. It means we're alive and we love being alive because every day that we can overcome a challenge, every day that we can become better, we're allowing ourselves the opportunity to become closer to Hashem. So my dear friends, have a magnificent Shabbos. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everybody.